If you're looking for a friend in financial services, you've come to the right place. The Society exists to help you make the right decisions as you travel down your path to prosperity. Tonight, we're going to be talking about an often misunderstood program called a covered call. It's useful to make some income on your stocks, but it's abused by many of the seminar operators. So don't miss tonight's Master of Money. This Master of Money is sponsored by Harvest Investment Services, a registered investment advisor where they harvest gains and minimize losses, and by Superstock Investor, bringing institutional research to individuals. Our special guest tonight is Mr. Jeff Garbaz, Principal at Superstock Investor and Principal at Quantitative Partners. This Master of Money program was produced Tuesday, April 14, 2015. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Master of Money program. I'm Steve Beeman, your host, and I am so thankful that you've chosen to spend another half hour with us as we help you learn what to do as you travel down your path to prosperity. We know that it's important, and that's why this society exists, to serve you, the investor, and help give you the content, information, and tools you need to build a happier and more thriving and prosperous life. So thanks once again for joining us. Tonight, we're going to dig a little deeper into a topic that's often misunderstood, we're going to talk about writing covered calls, and that may sound complicated to you, but we hope at the end of tonight's program, you'll be able to join us in the institutional world of just having a writing covered call strategy as part of your quiver of arrows. We want to thank you once again for joining us. Now, last week when we uh, had the program, we talked about inflation and we talked about the viability of your money. We talked about the nature of a fiat currency and what that means to you. And we had a wonderful segment with our guest, Doug Roberts, who talked about the Federal Reserve's policies on monetary expansion and eased some people's fears when it came to hyperinflation. Doug was very clear to all of us on the nature of hyperinflation and the fact that in the United States today, we are not set up for that. So we were glad to have him on. And by the way, one thing he mentioned that you might want to remember is that in his opinion, talking to the people he knows at the Federal Reserve, when the Fed does start to raise interest rates later this year, I think he used the phrase that it would be like watching moss grow on trees, not something to be overly concerned about. As always, if you have questions about last week's program, please write us at questions at safefinancial.org, and we'll be happy to get those questions answered as fast as we can. Now, in our viewer questions this week, I had a young man who wrote me and said, Steve, I'm going to a trading seminar offered by, well, I won't name it, but one of the trading seminar firms. You've read about them. They send you emails all the time, and you hear about them on the radio. Well, he asked my opinion as to whether or not I thought it was a valid thing. And what I said to him, and I'll say to you now, is this. Yes, sometimes the trading strategy sessions that are taught teach good things. And I know a lot of folks who make a great deal of money trading stocks, so I would never say it doesn't work. However, I cautioned him as I would caution you. Winning in the game of trading is much, much different than looking at computerized outputs. There's a lot of slippage between you and a computer. So when an operator at a seminar shows you how great these returns have been, well, your returns may not replicate that just because you're a human being. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who trade these systems, and when the system says sell a position, well, they hold on just a little longer because emotionally they think, well, that stock's got to keep going up. Or if they've taken a little loss and the system says sell it, their instinct is, well, you know what, I'll wait. Maybe it'll come back and I'll regain my loss. Well, the fact of the matter is, for those of you who've tried this and for those who succeed at it, you know it's not as easy as it looks. So I caution this person that, hey, before you go spend a couple of thousand dollars on one of these fancy Fibonacci ratio trading systems, why don't you talk to the society first? Learn what we know, then go out and make your decision to play in that space. Now, moving into the geopolitical world, again, we have a world that is in turmoil is too strong a word, but certainly developing chaos. The biggest news out of the Middle East continues to be Yemen. And if you're not familiar with that, the problem we have is that the nation of Yemen sits between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, 
And the problem with that is that it's an oil line. And oil has to pass right along the coast of Yemen. Well, in that very strategically located country, you've got Saudi Arabia partnered with Pakistan fighting against Iran. Well, obviously, you've watched The Master of Money and you watch the evening news, so you know that Iran is currently in negotiations for nuclear weapons with the United States. Well, that's got the Saudis a little upset. So in Yemen, we're seeing this play out in a hot war in real time. All of us wished peace in the Middle East, and we hope that this gets resolved sooner than later. But it's a hot spot that you and I continue to watch here on The Master of Money. Now, if we go down and we kind of move over to China, and I want to bring China into this, we've talked about the Asian Infrastructure Bank that's developing, but recent data has shown China's economy slowing down significantly. They had a great deal of overdevelopment in the real estate markets in the last 10 years, and that's finally coming to an end. In addition, the declining oil prices, as much as you think that would help their economy, is actually slowing the Chinese economy down because they have a big energy sector just like we do. So China is creating some ruffles over there because not only are they trying to move forward with this infrastructure bank, but they're devoting ever increasing amounts of money on a military, specifically a navy. Now that's costing a lot of money in the Chinese government and together with the overall economic slowdown, slowing economies plus increased military expenditures oftentimes leads to a slower overall growth rate. So in the Middle East, we're seeing some instability continue. In China, we're watching that. I will share with you, though, we've talked about this good and bad economy. The folks at Brown Brothers Harriman, a long venerated investment bank, came out and published a, revo a report in advance of the Federal Reserve's Beige Book. The Beige Book is the book the Federal Reserve uses to produce its economic numbers. And the folks at Brown Brothers Harriman made a pretty, I'll say, strong statement about the fact that they think the recent slowdown in home sales, consumer spending, and manufacturing is overblown. They're pretty sure it was just a blip based on some bad weather here in the United States. Well, that's quite possible. The folks who watch us living in Boston know you certainly got your share of snow. And as weather does affect things like auto sales and home sales, it can have a material effect on the economy. Whether or not the Brown Brothers folks are right and we'll see robust growth in the third and fourth quarters of this year, nobody knows. But we do know that we live in an economy right now that you and I've talked about that is volatile. That volatility simply means make sure you have adequate risk controls and learning tonight's option strategies can help be part of that. So we're glad once again that you've chosen to join us. We know you have an awful lot of different choices you can make when you look to your time and your allocation. So we're glad you spend it here with us. Now, um, and other things that I think are extremely relevant, let me go down. There are some meetings that you should be aware of. The European leaders of the International Monetary Fund are here in Washington this week talking about the IMF's position vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Again, you've watched Greece. They have significant problems. In fact, the Grecian government came out recently and said they were going to use Bitcoin as their national currency. Well, if you're not familiar with Bitcoin, it's one of these cryptocurrencies. And the fact that the Grecian government would even suggest using that for the national currency? You got to wonder what's going on in their head. We do know that the Russians are making very aggressive advances to Greece. They've offered to loan them money to help them out and to trade some of the Grecian assets to Russia. Well, that creates instability in Europe as the IMF and the European community has loaned a huge amount of money to Greece. That's why they're in Washington. We know Greece is coming up against some major deadlines and the IMF people are trying to decide how to deal with it. Importantly, in the finance side, um, as the society has talked before, the Obama administration last week came out with hearings on the increasing threat of cybersecurity in the United States. There's a lot of fear, and I should say cyber terrorism. The security res uh, response to that's what we're talking about. Public companies especially have been the target of cyber attacks, increasingly geared toward getting their employee data. Well, we all know about identity theft. We know that trade secrets and patents can be taken over the internet. So cybersecurity becomes an increasingly important topic. In fact, it's important enough that the society will be hosting a symposium to discuss that in the near future. Oil, that often talked about commodity, stays at about $59 a barrel. You and I've talked in the past. It was at 49.48, it's jumped up a little bit. 
But I've had discussions on TV with people who say, no, oil's going to go to $20 a barrel. Well, I've retorted to that regularly that I don't think that'll happen. And the reason for that is below about $50 a barrel, it's not worth the refiner's time to produce it. Well, sure enough, as oil came down below 50, U.S. production began to drop. Oil rigs began pumping a little less of that black gold, and so oil prices jumped back up to about 58. As we've said for a long time now, barring any big disruptions to the supply of oil, we would expect it to stay in this range for an extended period of time. Another reason we want to watch the geopolitical events. Last week, the markets had a pretty darn good week. All three of the indexes went back above their record levels. The S&P climbed back above 2,100, the Dow above 18,000, and the NASDAQ back, back among, or above 5,000. We were very, very happy to see that. We always love to see the masters of money making money. But another point to that, we want to make sure you do if the markets go down as well. Now, when we come back tonight, we're going to dig into this concept of covered call strategies. I've spoken about it before. We've done classes on this before, but it's so important that you have to get comfortable with it. I've talked to many, many people who have one of two things. They either go to seminars where people teach them how to rent stocks, and for thousands of dollars, they learn how to write a covered call. On the other side, I have people I've worked with who've sold businesses and worked in their own capital accounts and don't know how to generate income on the stocks they hold. Well, writing a covered call can serve you in a number of ways. It can hedge a position. It can generate additional income. And when we come back, we're going to learn how to do that. We will be joined once again by my good friend and our professional trader, Mr. Jeff Garbaz, principal of Quantitative Partners and Superstock. So stick around for the second half for the Master of Money. We'll be right back. Have you ever gone online and Googled the words financial advice? When you do, you get over 3 million results. That's a lot of places that want to tell you what to do with your money. There are new websites that take your information, run it through their calculators, and generate automated financial advice with recommendations about how you should invest your assets and plan for your future. They're called robo-advisors, but they're not real advisors because they're not real people. Robo-advisors crunch data, then spit out cookie-cutter recommendations based on financial formulas they have created. Robo-advisors don't know your family, your history, or your personality. They don't know how you feel about your children or your charities. They don't understand what you hope to accomplish with your money. So here's the question. How can you trust financial advice from a source that doesn't actually know who you are or how you feel? You can't. Why? Because you are a person, not a number. You're an individual, not an algorithm. To get personalized advice, you want a qualified financial advisor who knows you, not a computerized avatar that thinks it does. You want an advisor with proper credentials and credibility, supported by an organization with compliant process and protocol. That's what we have. That's who we are. And we have the ability to understand you better than any computer program. Of course, we have the latest innovative technology, too. But we use our technology differently. We use technology to support our expertise, not to replace it. We analyze, evaluate, and interpret your data to provide advice specifically for you. Advice about how to achieve your unique financial goals. Robo-advisors can crunch numbers, but numbers are only part of your story. The formula we follow puts you in the center of the equation, and that's exactly where you want to be. Welcome back to the program. You know, we are all about helping you develop a good path to prosperity. And again, if you ever have content that you need to hear about, please write us at questions at safefinancial.org, and we'll do a special program just for you. In fact, tonight's program was developed because one of our masters of money actually asked us to do this. So we're happy to accommodate our masters always. But before we begin, I want to lighten things up just a little bit and share a th thought with you and a little background on myself. I had a member last week who actually said to me, 
why is it you always wear a suit for the master of money? Don't you feel like it's a little overly formal? Well, I'll share with you why I do. And it goes back to my youth when I met a gentleman one time who was a customer of mine, customer of mine and I hadn't worn a suit that day. And he said to me, well, Steve, let me ask you this question. If you were visiting the White House today, meeting with, at that time, President Reagan, what would you wear? And I said to him, well, I'd wear a blue suit with a white shirt and a nice tie and have my shoes polished and try to look as good as I could. And he looked me square in the eye and he said, am I less important to you? Well, ever since then, I've been wedded to wearing suits. And the fact of the matter is you are as important to me as the President of the United States. And that's why I wear a suit for you. So anyway, we begin tonight to go down this more detailed path on the option call strategies. And I want to share this with you because it's an important thing. A lot of people get talked into going to seminars where they talk about renting stocks. And I hear the ads on Chicago radio all the time. Learn how to make 2 to 3% a month renting stocks. Well, this is the strategy they're talking about. And I want to share that with you because you have to understand that, yes, the viability is there to generate that type of return, but there is a risk. And we're going to talk about the risks right now. But let me begin by talking about the basics. And this is important to understand just the terminology on these things. So there are five key points I want to start off with in this segment. First, let's talk about what is an option. I mean, very simply, an option is exactly what it says. It gives you the privilege to do something in the future. In the case of stocks and what we're talking about right now, an option gives you the right to buy a stock from someone else at a predetermined time and price. Options are not requirements to exercise. They're options for you. It's a little bit like it's been a, a, likened to an insurance policy where you can buy an option and if your house burns down, you use, the, you know, use the insurance policy, but you don't have to use it. Well, an option's the same thing. There are two general types of options. There are calls that give you the right to buy something and puts that give you the right to sell it. Well, tonight we're concerned with the former, so let me continue. When I talk about writing an option, that's a fancy way of saying I'm going to sell an option. Wall Street likes to confuse people with the terminology they use, and that's all that is. The idea of writing an option means that you sell an option to someone else. We're going to give very specific details in a moment on what that means. But conceptually, all you're doing is selling someone else the right to take some action in the future. Well, let's extend this. If we know what an option is and we know what selling an option is, Let's talk more about this call option specifically. A call option gives someone else the right to take something away from you at a future point in time. A call option, for example, gives the holder of that, the buyer, the right to call that stock away from you at a predetermined price and time. It's not that complicated. If you have an asset today worth $10 and you give someone else the call option on it at 20 that means they can call that away from you at 20. Again, I've got details on this I'm going to share in just a minute. So I want to take the call option idea to the next level. And that's if we know what an option is, we know what it is to write an option, and we know what a call option is, what is a covered call? Well, a covered call simply is writing a call option, selling an option for someone else to buy an asset from you, where you do own the asset. This is known as a covered call. Most often it's used when someone owns a share of stock and they don't mind selling it, so they sell someone else the right to take it away from them in the future. There are a couple of different reasons people will do this, and we're going to talk about those too. So we know that writing a covered call option isn't complicated. It's simply a matter of selling to someone else the option to take away something from you at a predetermined price and time. So why would somebody do this? And that perhaps is the most often asked questions. And there are a couple of big reasons people will do this. Let's look first at the buyers. Why would somebody buy a call? Well, you got two things there. First of all is a speculation, and the second is a hedge. The hedge is pretty simple. Let's assume that you have a, a portfolio in which you have gone short or you've sold short a share of stock in IBM. Well, the way you would get hurt in that case if the, is if the price of IBM jumped through the roof, 
Well, you might buy a call option to hedge against that. That's a smart use of options. It's used all the time. The second is a little more speculative. Let me give you some details. I pulled these numbers uh, Monday night, so they may be a little different today. But if you went out today to buy a sh 100 shares of IBM, it's about $163 a share. That would cost you $16,300 to buy 100 shares. OK, that math is pretty easy. But let's assume you don't have $16,000. You just don't have it. You maybe have it in a month, but you don't have it today. And you have information or insight, you believe, that's going to cause IBM stock to run up between now and some future date because of something you know about. So you look and say, well, wow, at 163, I'd love to buy a bunch of that, but I don't have $16,000. Well, one of the ways you can acquire that stock is to buy a call option on it. Let's be very specific. Right now, for about $3.30, you can go out and buy the right to buy a share of stock in IBM at $165. Now remember, the stock's trading at $163, so you're buying the right to acquire it at $165, so a little bit above where it is today. But if you believe that price is going to go up, this is a great way for you to leverage your returns. Let me give you specifics again. Assume that you buy a call option today that gives you the right to acquire IBM at $165 30 days from now. You pay $3.30 for that privilege, and 30 days from now, you were right. The IBM stock has gone up to $170. Well, you don't have to pay $170 when you're ready to buy it. You only have to pay $165, which is the value of that option you bought. So here's the math. You paid $3.30 for the option. You made $5 on the stock, that difference between $170 and 165 So you made a $1.70 profit. Now think about that with me. You made a $1.70 profit on a $3.30 trade. That's almost a 50% return on your money. Now if you were to do that month over month over month, you would generate something like a 24% annual return. And that's where the operators you hear on the radio say, make 2% a month. Well, it works if you made the call right on IBM. But what if you were wrong? What if the stock dropped from 163 to 150? Well, because you own a call option, you can only lose the amount of the premium you paid, that $3.30. You can't lose any more than that. So you don't really lose in that transaction any more than you've already paid. But you did lose 100% of the insurance premium, that $3.30. So here's the bottom line. If you want to leverage your buying of stocks, you can do it by buying call options. Now, I would call that speculation because the reality is it's extremely hard to predict the future. And unless you know something none of the rest of us know about what's going to happen with IBM, well, you have no way to know that stock's going to run up in the next 30 days. And if you do know something none of us know, well, that can be called insider trading. You want to be very careful in those waters. So the buyers typically fall into those two camps. They're either, he they're either hedging a bet or they're speculating. Let's flip the coin a little bit. Let's go to a seller. Why would you want to sell a call? Well, this is a very elegant strategy you can use to raise income on a stock. And again, let's use IBM as the example. Let's assume for a moment you own 100 shares of IBM. You inherited it, you earned it, you bought it, what, however you got it. But you're pretty comfortable with it. You don't really want to sell it. You'd be happy to sell it at around 165, but you don't really care. You, you don't think it's going to go down a lot. You're comfortable with that. So you hold the stock, and it's generating a little dividend. You kind of like that. But again, if it went to 165, you might consider selling it. All right. Well, here's the math on this. Owning that stock at $163 a share, you can sell someone else a call option on it to buy it from you at $165. In other words, you're selling someone else the right to take that stock away from you if it reaches $165 a share. Well, that's your price point anyway. So you say, well, I'd be willing to do that. Well, here's the thing. They'll pay you to do it. That $3.30 premium that our um, seller or our buyer paid is going to go to you. So you get to put on 100 shares, $3,300 right square in your pocket. And you have zero risk. 
If the stock goes down, you don't have to give the money back. If it stays flat, you don't have to give the money back. And if the stock goes above 165, well, you're going to get paid $165 for it. It's a pretty elegant way to raise income on stocks. And again, this is often called a way to rent stocks. I think that's a pretty bad analogy. But the fact of the matter is, if you're sitting on a stock holding and you don't think it's going to go precipitously down, but you, you say, oh, okay, I'd sell it if it went up a little bit, selling a call against it is a very nice way to get some income on that, which does hedge your downside a bit. For every dollar of premium you get, that's another dollar down that you don't lose. So it's an elegant way to hedge your position a little bit and generate some income. Now the reality is selling covered calls works in a market that's in a very short trading range like we're in right now. If the market establishes in a downtrend or in an uptrend, you don't want to be selling options against it because you won't be able to make as much money. But in a market like we're in right now, these can be pretty handsomely rewarded. We're going to be joined tonight by Mr. Jeff Garbaz, my longtime friend and principal of Quantitative Partners, as well as Super Stock Investor. Through Quantitative Partners, Jeff works with some of the major big hitters in the institutional world, and through Superstock, he brings that research to you. So we're going to go to an interview with Jeff right now. Jeff, welcome once again to the Master of Money program. I want to thank you for being with us. We've been talking today about covered calls, and I've been speaking with the masters about how they can be used for three things, really. They can be used to hedge a position, they can be used to speculate, certainly, and they can be used to generate additional income. But they're not a perfect vehicle, as some seminar operators would like us to believe. So we wanted to get your thoughts as a professional trader. Yeah, options are a, uh, are a tricky thing. You know, I, uh, I started out basically uh, doing a newsletter in 2007, Golden Energy Options Trader, where I'm making directional bets on, uh, on options. And in that time period, I typically would be buying a call if I thought it was going to go up in price, and I'd be buying a put if I thought it was going to go down in price. And then we, uh, we migrated a little bit, and we were doing spread trades, which is where we would buy, a, let's say a stock was trading at $40. We'd buy a 40 call, and we'd sell a 45 call because we were thinking that in the time period we held it, it wouldn't get up to $45. And so we'd capture money in between. We did a great job with that. And on the same thing on the put side, we do put spreads where uh, we'd buy an in the money put. Let's say we bought, it was at 40, we'd buy a 40 put. And then we'd sell a 35 put because we didn't think it was getting down to uh, 35. So there's the straight um, just buying call or put, uh, making a directional bet. Then there's doing spread trades. And the third element of this is where you have stocks in a portfolio and then you're selling calls or you're also selling puts trying to collect income. That is a, uh, that's a, that's a tricky thing to do. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very misunderstood. I think people are led to believe that it's really easy to make money doing that. Yeah, there's a seminar operator that advertises here in Chicago that you can rent stocks and make 2% a month with no risk. That's, that's a little tough because, uh, you know, look, you can do the typical Graham and Dodd analysis, figure out that a company's cheap, buy it, put it away, and not have to worry about it. When you're, when you're trading options, uh, you, have, you have to deal with theta, and you have to deal with decay factors, and you also have to deal with what happens if something runs. So let's use a simple example. I'm going to buy a stock that's $40 in price, and I'm going to go sell a, uh, a 44 call because I don't think it's going to get to $44. And let's say uh, this week is the uh, expiration week for, uh, for April. It's the third week of April. So let's say I'm going to do a May one. i got five weeks, and that stock, if it moves above $44, all of a sudden the, the option is going to go up in value at a greater clip, and I'm going to start to uh, not participate on the upside as uh, much. So that can be a, uh, an issue. The other issue is if you, uh, if you own the stock and you uh, sell a put, and then the stock breaks to the downside. Let's say some bad news comes out. All of a sudden, you got a bigger loss. And uh, who knows how far it could go down. All right. Well, let me, let me drill you in real quick because we, we've got this broad issue of options that you and I have talked about so often. But focus in for me on these people watching tonight on this covered call strategy because that's what they're getting told they can make all kinds of money writing covered calls. You know, that's true when you're in a, uh, when you're in a bull market. If, if we go into a, uh, a bear market, um, you know, the 2000 to 2003 period, options weren't as big 
and people weren't trading options as much. But definitely in 07 into, um, into 09, people were. And I know several people who were trying to do this almost as, as, as a living, and, uh, mm-hmm. and they got buried because the problem was the underlying stock might have dropped 25% in value over a month or two months, and then what they were writing only made them 3 or 4%. So let's say you made 4%, but your stock dropped 20%. You're still down 16%. So I, I would advocate having some type of, uh, of system in place to determine that we're in an uptrend and that you actually do want to be uh, you know, writing calls. Um, if we're not in an uptrend, either on the overall market, you gotta, you got to think about three things when you're, when you're, um, when you're coming in on a, uh, on a covered call. What's going on with the stock? Is the stock in an uptrend, sideways, or in a downtrend? What's going on with its sector? Same deal. Um, uptrend, sideways, downtrend. And then the overall market with equities. There, there are three different ways that a stock can correct. And um, if you have either the stock correcting or if you have the sector correcting, like a good example right now are utilities. People think that like utilities are fine to do because they pay good dividends. They've come down a fair amount. Well, the, the problem with utilities right now is if, if interest rates really do start to rise and we start to get better economic numbers in the U.S. and around the world, granted the first quarter has been quiet, mm-hmm. but um, utilities like, like XLU is trading around 43 and change and it could break um, down to 40 or so and all of a sudden you're owning um, the stock, the dividend doesn't pay enough, um, you get another 10 or 15% drop in the price of some of these utilities and your option is only making you 3 or 4%, that ends up being a, uh, a tough equation. So for most people, this is a strategy. And the example I use, Jeff, is let's say somebody sells a company and they're loaded up with a stock. If yep. they think that stock is stable and it's in just a short trading range, to sell calls against it might make sense to generate some income. But That's they're going to get called out and lose the upside, and they're not that protected on the downside. Correct. I mean... Ultimately, if you just want to be completely hedged, the way to do it is to do uh, both a put and a call, own the stock, and then you don't have anything to worry about, but you're going to just totally limit your, your upside and your downside. Right, so you're putting a collar around the stock value. Yeah, exactly, and that's, that's what happens a lot of time when, like you said, people sell a business. That's how, uh, how it plays out. But, I mean, look, you, you buy a stock and then you do the option. You've got to determine whether the option is, is fairly valued whether it's overvalued, whether it's undervalued, you have to do analysis on the option as well. And then yeah. you have to do analysis on the, on the price chart as well. One thing I like to look at is an indicator called choppiness, which tells me if a, um, if a stock is in an uptrend uh, or if it's getting ready to start an uptrend or if the trend is exhausted. And then second thing, I like to use average true range. Average true range tells me how much it typically moves in, in a given period. So I could do average true range on one minute, three minutes, five minutes, a day, a week, two weeks, three weeks. If I'm if I'm going out of the money by like say three dollars, but the weekly move is say six dollars, that might not be a very good bet. I might end up losing a uh, a fair amount of money within that period. Well, here we go. And Jeff, we're limited on time, so I need to close the segment out. But I do want to thank you. And folks, you can understand why professionals like Jeff make money in the markets where the novice people coming in thinking they can make it easy don't. So, Jeff, thank you very much. We look forward to having you on once again. Thanks for having me, Steve. I want to thank Jeff Garbaz for taking his time to join us on The Master of Money. All of the professionals I bring to you are highly paid and it's nice of them to donate their time to a generous effort like this. We at the Society are always there to help you, and don't forget to write us at questions at safefinancial.org anytime, and we'll get back to you with the answers you need. I want to thank all of our sponsors, of course, Harvest Investment Services, who lets us use their facility and helps fund some of our efforts, as well as Superstock, who's providing institutional research to our members. I want to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week as we continue to travel down our paths. And in the interim, pardon me, I hope that you have a safe, happy, and prosperous week. And I'll see you next week for another edition of The Master of Money. 